Okay, so last um, class we talked about um, monopoly, but we assumed that the um, product uh, was fixed in terms of everything other than sort of the level of the price for the product and how many people purchased it. So all the details of the pricing and all the details of the design of the product were fixed. And today, we're going to focus on the opposite. We're going to focus on how firms select uh, the design and the pricing details of their product or line of products. And this is going to cover a lot of what's typically called mechanism design or contract theory. So we'll talk first about perfect, perfect or first degree price discrimination and its limits. And once we've sort of gotten rid of the possibility of first degree price discrimination being possible, we're going to talk about the tools and goals that firms have when they actually do design their products. We'll then study a model uh, which is called the Spence Vega Weil model. It's my uh, building with Andre Vega on the framework of Mike Spence from the 1970s. And that will use Leibniz's rule as a mathematical tool to study all the types of issues we'll be discussing in the design of products. And that will divide effects into two margins, into an extensive margin of how many people buy your products or which people buy your products. Um, and this will allow us to think about explicit or third degree price discrimination as well as many of the aspects of the qualitative characteristics of products, in particular the hoteling model, as well as about platforms or firms whose products are valued based on the set of consumers who choose to purchase them, as well as some empirical measurement of those things. The second effect that it will divide things into is the intensive margin, or how much each of the consumers who does participate in the product chooses to participate. And that will allow us to discuss the idea of second degree price discrimination and nonlinear pricing. Okay. So, uh, Gabrielle is not here. Uh, does anyone else want to say why, what first degree price discrimination is and why it's the ideal? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And why is that ideal? Yeah. Yeah. So you'll choose to maximize surplus if you can capture all of it, right? Um, so you charge everyone a personalized price and everyone a different price for each unit sold. You match everything exactly to people's willingness to pay and therefore you do exactly what's in the interest of consumers because you want to maximize the consumer surplus that you're able to capture, right? Now, we almost never observe this in the real world. Uh, it's really a theoretical benchmark, but there are some things that come somewhat close to it. So, for example, if you have bargaining and one side is a very effective bargainer, they may be able to extract most of the willingness of the other side to pay and therefore have an interest in maximizing their surplus. Some personalized pricing systems on the internet are a little bit like this. So I don't know if anyone's ever used one of these sites like Priceline where they like, you know, give you a price at the exact moment you're thinking about purchasing it based on all the observations they have of everything that you've done in the past. So that sort of internet pricing is getting closer to the ideal of uh, first degree price discrimination. And actually, one really interesting trade-off that's been going on on the internet is on the one hand, it's made it much easier for people to compete and make you know, available to people information about the prices that all the firms are offering. But on the other hand, it's given firms so much more information about consumers' prices, about consumers' valuations, that it's allowed them to come much closer to first degree price discrimination. So there's, both of these are improving information and making markets more efficient. But there's a race in terms of whether those rents are going to go to the firms or to the consumers. Um, 
CVS, which is a pharmacy in the United States, has a very extensive system of coupons where based on everything you've ever done at a CVS store, everything you've ever bought, every time you've ever swiped your card anywhere, it knows all of your transactions history and therefore is able to give you very precisely targeted coupons that come close to doing first degree price discrimination. So from the perspective of the monopolist, this is the best possible uh, thing because he'll get everything. And therefore, companies are always going to be looking for better ways to get close to first degree price discrimination. But it's terrible for the consumers because they gain no surplus. Now, a natural question is, what is total social value? Well, we know that um, once uh, the firm is first degree price discriminating, it's going to capture uh, all the value and therefore will maximize total social surplus. And in fact, this is just as efficient as perfect competition because every consumer who's willing to pay a price above cost is generating some positive surplus which can be captured by the firm. Um, and because you can't make anyone pay more than it's worth to them and you charge them exactly what it's worth, anytime there is you know, positive social benefit to be gained, the firm can gain profits from that and therefore the monopolist will do exactly what's efficient. Um, so the reason why first degree price discrimination does so well is it eliminates the basic monopoly trade-off that selling more is going to require uh, lowering your price. The seller can now capture exactly the value that he creates and therefore tries to maximize the value create, created but consumers gain no surplus and this creates a major distributive problem that leads to objections to first degree price discrimination and makes it often unpopular. But because it's more efficient, it seems like there should be a way to redistribute wealth so as to make uh, first degree price discrimination superior to the alternatives. So economists often advocate having first degree price discrimination paired with some method of redistributing the surplus created by the monopolist. Um, and Juan Castillo, what, um, what are some of these redistributive methods potentially? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so taxes are one very natural method. Another way is to have people bid for the right to be the monopolist who can do this first degree price discrimination through an auction. Um, another thing that can act like a tax is that the labor unions for the firm, knowing that the firm has a lot of profits, can uh, demand higher wages and extract the money from the firm that way. Um, now, none of these solutions is as perfect as it sounds because this requires a very competent redistributive authority who needs to know exactly how much profits the firm is making. Um, it also may not be so beneficial uh, to redistribute because, as we'll talk about tomorrow, allowing the firm to capture a large part of the benefits that it creates by entering a market will help encourage firms to create products in the first place. Um, and First degree price discrimination, the nice thing about it is that it's very, very simple. You know, the basic principles I just articulated are extremely simple. And to a large extent, when you think about other forms of price discrimination done by a monopolist, they're just going to be weaker versions of this. And so you can sort of think of most other forms of price discrimination as some combination of, you know, the standard monopoly situation and this situation. And so the lessons we learned here about it harming consumers, benefiting the firm, increasing efficiency overall, um, and potentially being addressable by having redistribution are often more broadly applicable uh, to, to other forms of price discrimination. Now, whatever its merits though, first degree price discrimination is extremely difficult. And this is the reason why we rarely see it in practice. So uh, Francisco is not here. Francisco Ortega, right? Um, does anyone else want to mention what are some of the barriers to implementing it in practice? Yeah, Danielle Bernal. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, that's... Yeah, that's right. So arbitrage is a big issue. Another issue is administrative costs, just 
trying to report all these different prices to other people. Um, a lot of people think price discrimination is unfair and get upset with a company that does it even if it favors them. Um, but I think the most important reason is that the company has to have this incredible amount of information about how much consumers are willing to pay for the product, right? And in fact, I think that even the arbitrage problem is basically a problem of information. Because if I knew whether someone was going to sell it later, or I could track who actually consumed it, there would be no arbitrage problem, right? So really, in some sense, most of the problems with implementing price discrimination are fundamentally problems of knowing what the person's going to do with the product, who the person is, how much they're willing to pay, et cetera. Okay, so um, in considering how you design products, there are basically two crucial considerations, right? In almost any problem. First, what are the goals that you're trying to achieve in designing the products or pricing the products? And second, what are the methods you have available to you to do that? So your goals are usually to keep costs low and prices high, while at the same time attracting as many consumers as possible. And as we'll talk about in a bit, you don't just want to attract as many consumers as possible, but you want to try to attract the most valuable types of consumers or avoid the consumers who are most costly to serve. And what makes consumers? Valuable or costly? Well, they can either be valuable directly to the firm or they can be valuable because other consumers value having them as part of the product. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Now, the tools or instruments that firms usually have available to them in doing this are uniform prices, prices that get charged to everyone, which is not what we're going to talk about very much today because we talked about that yesterday, uh, on Friday, right? Second are more discriminatory or sophisticated part, forms of pricing. R the range of products and services that you offer. The quality or ease of using the products that are offered. The niche or market segment to which the product is targeted. Advertising or marketing to consumers and the way in which you place your products into stores. Great yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, no, elasticity is not going to determine how valuable the consumers are. It's just going to determine how easy or hard it is to attract the consumers. The things I'm thinking about in terms of most valuable consumers interact often with this. So one of the tools you have in designing your product is actually which consumers you attract to the product. So think about Facebook. What made Facebook so valuable is that they were able to attract all these really educated college students who then attracted everybody else, right? So you were trying to attract some students in order to make the product more valuable for other users, right? And sometimes the most valuable consumers are the ones who are best at attracting other consumers to join the product. Another example of that would be a nightclub which tries to get beautiful women to show up because that will attract other people to come to the club, right? So the main goal of today's class is to give you a framework for and a bunch of examples of how firms use all of these tools to uh, produce products that are going to help them accomplish these goals. So a common way of dividing up the tools available to firms is into vertical versus horizontal product characteristics. So vertical product characteristics are ones that all consumers agree are good or bad. Price is the simplest example of one of these, but quality, overall quality of a product more generally is an example of that. So speed of connection to the internet, level of insurance coverage, things like that. Consumers may differ in how much they value these, but they all value them. On the other hand, a horizontal product characteristic is one that some consumers view as good, but others view as bad. So consumers often have an ideal point. They'd like the product to be exactly this color, no more red, no more blue than that, right? So we'll often, we'll see a simple model of this below, but these are things like colors, flavors, designs, styles, political bias in a newspaper, for example. But also, and often more common, is what I would call a diagonal product characteristic. This is something that most consumers view as valuable, 
but some may view as harmful. So the, the thing to note about this is that what defines a consumer characteristic as vertical versus horizontal is not so much a characteristic of the characteristic itself, but rather how consumers feel about it and how they feel differently about it. It's the nature of the heterogeneity of consumers that makes something vertical or horizontal. Okay, now economists often see price discrimination as a separate question from the design of the product. Um, and when they say price discrimination, they usually mean two things. One is third degree or explicit price discrimination, where I break up the population into distinct groups and I charge different prices to these distinct groups. Um, the second is what's called second degree or implicit price discrimination, in which different offerings are meant to attract different types of consumers to them. Um, often we offer different packages of goods to different consumers, so like first class versus second class on an airplane, right? Um, now, often though, features that aren't exactly a quote unquote price serve a similar purpose. Um, in particular, non-price product features can attract desired groups or be more attractive to some people who I want to target than to others. So for example, think about restaurant promotions or menus. Now those are not exactly prices, but they're a feature of the design of products that are meant to appeal to certain types of people. Or think about Andres Carnes de Reis. I don't know how many people have been there. Uh, but you know, they have big areas out in, what's the city where it's located? Chia. Ch Chia. Where they have, you know, you can dance in a certain place and then there's a room for kids and whatever. So they're doing that to try to target extra benefits to people who are families. So is that price discrimination or not? Well, it sort of is. They're sort of doing a non-price thing that is giving a lower effective price to the families to come than to other people, right? Because the families can take advantage of the place for the kids. But it's not literally through a price. It's through some non-price feature that's giving extra utility to certain types of people rather than to others. So therefore, what I want to do today is set up a unified framework that will help you think about both the design of products and their quote unquote pricing in a way that's all based around some very simple fundamental principles that will come out of a model we'll develop. And this will show you the continuum between the economic principles determining price discrimination and the economic principles determining how you want to design your products more broadly. Now, um, to give you some examples of things that are in between price discrimination and product design, let's talk about uh, just some other examples of ways firms try to chop up consumers. So one of these are called what's called loyalty or personalized discounts. So I don't know if you guys have for like Kuroya the little card that lets you get a discount, right? If you come back to Kuroya a lot, they'll give you a big discount, right? In the United States, CVS, which is a pharmacia, does the same thing, right? So um, they offer targeted discounts based on your previous purchasing behavior. So that's sort of price discrimination and it sort of has to do with how you interact with the firm, right? So it gives you, it allows firms to get a lot closer to perfect price discrimination, but it may also give you an incentive to manipulate the system. If you realize you can get discounts if you do a particular thing, that may give you an incentive to do that thing. Another example of this is intertemporal sales. Uh, so department stores and outlet stores and many uh, places often have periodic ribajas, right? And the reason they have these ribajas is that if you're a really rich person who doesn't mind spending a lot, you'll just show up and buy the stuff whenever you feel you need it, right? But if you're someone who is more price sensitive, you'll wait for the ribaja to happen, right? And so this is a way of them chopping up consumers across time. Um, Airline tickets and hotel rooms are similar. So usually airline tickets will be cheap if you buy them way in advance, cheap if you buy them the day before, and expensive if you buy them a couple weeks ahead of time. Why? Because business people usually can't wait to the last minute on the chance that they won't be able to get the ticket, but they also don't know far and ahead of time when they need to travel. And so those are the people who are not so sensitive to price, so they target them during those times. 
right? Um, Add-ons and obfuscation is another example of this. So hotels often have a mini bar that's way overpriced relative to the costs that they're facing. Why is that? Well, because they think that if you don't have time to worry about uh, what that price is going to be, they can charge you through the roof for that thing, and you won't think about that when you're deciding among which hotel to go to, right? Or when you buy a printer, you usually don't think about how much it costs to buy the ink for the printer, right? So they can take advantage of people who don't spend the time to do the extra research in that way, right? Whereas the upfront price, everyone can see that really easily. Um, banks do this with lots of charges you get. You probably drive you crazy that like, you know, you'll have a check and it won't be exactly the right amount and then they'll charge you a bunch of money for that, right? Another uh, example of this was that my dad once had a, a calling card, a tarjeta para ser llamadas, and the, he, um, if you dialed into the number and then you were supposed to enter zero in the number you wanted to call, and if instead you just dialed the number you wanted to call, it didn't say anything to you. It connected you, but it charged you 100 times as much, right? Because it said that it had a connection fee because you didn't dial the card the right way, right? So that was just to take advantage of the fact that people uh, you know, didn't really understand what was going on, right? And so this basically is a way to discriminate against people who don't read the small print. So one of my favorite examples of this is uh, what I call miserable price discrimination. It's from the, uh, has anyone ever seen Les Miserables or read the book by, by Victor Hugo? Has anyone ever seen the play? Yeah, Anna's seen the play. So it's a musical on Broadway, one of the most successful Broadway musicals of all time. Um, and one of the characters in it is this guy, Monsieur Thenardier. And Monsieur Thenardier is this real huckster who runs uh, a hotel and who does lots of this type of price discrimination. And just for a little entertainment, I'm going to play for you the song where he talks about his price discrimination techniques. So that's a little bit of price discrimination in 19th century France. Um, and um, now I want to jump in to try to build a general model that will allow you to think about all of these types of, uh, of phenomena. So I want, to hire three, I want to highlight three different types of things which I think pretty much all price discrimination can be understood in the context of. The first effect is that firms will choose the characteristics of prices to try to cater to consumers who are marginal, who will buy the product or not buy the product based on uh, how much utility they're earning, rather than to consumers who will buy the product regardless of what, uh, uh, what happens. Second is that they'll tend to trade off getting consumers to use the product intensively in a way that can generate higher products for the firm versus trying to extract value from the people who are already buying the product. Right? So they'll face this trade-off between getting people to do more and getting them to pay more that way versus trying to get more money from the people who are already buying a lot of stuff. And that will help us understand things like the airline, uh, different classes on the airlines, uh, and charging additional amounts uh, for buying more of a product. And, the, and so the first one is really what I would call the extensive margin. This is what I would call the intensive margin. And this is what I would call sorting. So sorting is when firms try to attract particularly valuable consumers to purchase their products and to repel the less valuable consumers. So the first effect comes from a paper 
by Spence in 1975, uh, or was best expressed there. And uh, there was also a paper by Eitan Shashinsky, basically in the same year on that. Uh, the second comes from a paper by Musa Rosen in the late uh, 70s, uh, by Michael Musa and uh, Sherwin Rosen. And this third effect, um, as far as I know, first shows up in some joint work that I've been doing with Andre Vega really very recently. And our model nests all three of these effects. And so what I'm going to do is, um, is to start with the Spence model. Then I'll build on top of that the Musa-Rosen model. And then I'll build on top of that the fully general model of mine. And I'll use mine with Andre. And I'll, we'll use that to highlight these three effects. And then we'll spend the rest of the class going through a huge number of applications of these basic ideas to real world phenomena. OK, so um, let's suppose there's a bunch of consumers. And every consumer either buys a product or does not buy the product. And the utility that they get from purchasing the product depends on what type of consumer they are, which is going to be given by this vector theta, and the, some non-price characteristic of the product rho minus the price that they pay for the product. That's the utility they'll get from consuming. Um, and the types are distributed in some big space according to some smooth distribution function f of theta. So anyone who had, gets a utility that's weakly greater than the price will choose to purchase the product. And the sales that the firm will make, therefore, will be the integral over the set of all people who has a utility that exceeds the price of the density of people of that type. Right? Now, um, this product characteristic rho could represent some non-price characteristic, like how big of a space for kids do you build at your restaurant, in the case of Andres Carnes de Reyes. Or it could represent some pricing policy, like how much do you discriminate against different consumers in your prices. Right? So it captures both of those types of things. So let's let the set of people who choose to buy the product, theta, be given by the set of all types that receive a utility that exceeds the price. OK. Now, throughout, we're going to be taking derivatives of integrals like this. Right? That's going to be the name of the game. And to do this, we need an extension of Leibniz's rule. Now, Leibniz's rule is what allows us to take derivatives under integrals, right? And if you're trained in physics or math or engineering, you probably know the multidimensional extensions of Leibniz rules. If you were trained in economics, you probably took the class where you learned that and probably forgot about everything other than the Lagrange multipliers. Because all the multidimensional Leibniz rule stuff was for the physicists and not for you guys. So I think that's really unfortunate because I think that the multidimensional version of Leibniz's rule is one of the most powerful uh, tools for economists to use, but almost no economists know it. So now you will be among the f elite few who do know it. OK, so imagine that we now are going to take the derivative of an integral, which is defined in the following way. It's defined as the integral over x of the set of individuals for which g of y comma x is greater than or equal to 0 of f of y comma x. Right? So this is a multidimensional version of Leibniz's rule because I'm going to allow here x to be multidimensional. Okay. So just using the intuition from Leibniz's rule, uh, does anyone want to tell me what the two effects are going to be? Unless Eliot is here. Eli no. Go ahead, Juan. Yep. Exactly. So there's going to be a boundary effect, which is going to be the um, integral around the boundary, around the points where g is exactly equal to 0, of how much the boundary is changing at that point times the value of the function f at that point. That corresponds in the one-dimensional Leibniz's rule to the fact that you always have to take the derivative 
of the bound, you know, the limit points of the integral multiplied by the value of the function at that point, right? You guys probably remember that effect from the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? Now, in economic terms, this corresponds to the extensive margin. The people who enter or who exit the market, right? And formally, it's given by the integral over the set where g is equal to zero of f of y, comma x, sorry, f of y, comma x, times the rate at which g changes with respect to y. Now, this is a little bit of a loose shorthand because the set where g is equal to zero is of a smaller dimension than the set where g is greater than or equal to zero, right? It's actually sort of, if you think of it in a multidimensional space, a surface rather than a volume. Um, I don't think I have any pens. Um, yeah, that would be great, Miguel. Thanks. Oh, Sebastian's got one too. Okay, so um, in a two-dimensional space, if the set of people participating is up here, then the integral I want to take is along this curvy thing here, which is not exactly the same as taking an integral over this whole set here. So there's some technical details around what I literally mean by this thing here. And you can look at the paper if you want to look at those technical details. But I'm not going to spend too much time on it here because this is a valid sort of shorthand for what's going on. OK. The second effect, as Juan mentioned, is the effect on the interior. It's the integral over the interior of the derivative of the function. So this economically corresponds to the intensive margin. It says the people who are already in the market, how much more is going on with them, how much more utility are they getting, how much more are they contributing to profits, et cetera. So this is the integral over the set of all people who are strictly inside of the market of the derivative of f with respect to y. Okay. So we can define the set of marginal consumers as a set of people who are on the boundary, right? This is, I'm going to denote by partial theta, and will be the set of all types who get a utility that's exactly equal uh, to zero. Sorry. We get a utility that's exactly equal to price. Sorry about that. Utility equal to price, not utility equal to zero. OK. So let's try applying this. Uh, Maria, could you help me take the derivative of n, don't look at your slides, with respect to price using Leibniz's rule. Here was our definition of n, right? How do we take the derivative of this with respect to price using Leibniz's rule? Remember there are two effects, the boundary effect and the interior effect, right? Okay, so let's just, let's just go through the equations here, right? I said there were two effects, right? There was the integral over the interior of the derivative of the function that was inside with respect to price. Now look, does this function that's inside depend on price in any way? Directly does it depend on price in any way? F of theta. It's not a function of price, right? It's just a function of theta, right? So there's no interior effect. Does the boundary depend on price? Yes. How does it depend on price? Well, I wanted you to formulate it so that g of y and x is greater than 0, right? So what would, how would you reformulate this condition so that it was formulated that way? We want to we come up with some function g so that you're in the set if g of p, rho, and theta is greater than 0. How could you rewrite this in that way? Well, you just move p to the other side of the equation, right? So you can do u of rho and theta minus p is greater than 0. So then what's the derivative of g with respect to p?
That's what you need here, right? You need the derivative of g with respect to p. If g is equal to u minus p, what's the derivative with respect to p? Yeah, if g is u minus p, what's the derivative with respect to p? Exactly, exactly. So what are we going to get? We get that we get the negative of the integral over the boundary of the density, right? Because we get negative 1 for every person times the value of the function on the interior, which is f of theta. And so we get the negative of the integral over the boundary of f of theta d theta, right? Now, let's define the, the number of people on the margin, the integral of the boundary of the density. That's going to be sort of the, how many people are indifferent to be m. Let's just call, call that m. Now, we're going to choose to measure everything in terms of the fraction of people that are participating. Because that's just easier, because then we can deal with everything in terms of density functions and not have to multiply it by p numbers of people, right? So your cost will then depend on the fraction of people participating and the non-price characteristic rho. So the firm is going to make and seek to maximize profits, which are the product of price times the number of people minus the cost. And what is going to be the optimal price for the firm to set? Well, it's going to be the same as uh, before, which is that uh, Sorry, this should be n over m, not p over m. Sorry about that. This is incorrect. So the optimal price is going to again be the price minus the number of people who are purchasing the product divided by the number of people who are on the margin. That's just the same as price plus the derivative of price times the number of people. Because the number of people on the margin is the derivative of the number of people with respect to price or 1 over the derivative of price with respect to the number of people. And then you're going to set that equal to your marginal cost, which is the derivative of cost with respect to the number of people. OK, so that's the same principles as we learned from the monopoly case before. You're going to set marginal revenue equal to marginal cost, price plus p prime times n, or price minus n over m is equal to the number of as is equal to marginal cost. Uh, the more interesting thing, which is going to be new to this class, is how the firm is going to set its level of the non-price instrument. OK. So first, we need to figure out what would be the socially optimal level to set for this non-price instrument. Well, the value to the firm, uh, sorry, the value to society is the total utility that consumers earn minus the cost of serving them, right? Which is the integral over all the people who are consuming the product of the utility that they earn, right? So this is the integral over the participating set of the utility they earn times the density of the people. Where are the profits? Uh, profits of the firm are irrelevant, right? If we're just thinking about the total social welfare, the firm has costs. You know, look, I could put plus p times n and minus p times n, and then we would have the value to the consumers minus the fir plus the firm's profits. But instead, we can just eliminate that and forget about the fact that a firm exists and just say the total social value is the total value to to delivered to the consumers minus the total cost of providing that. Right? OK. Now, the way I'm going to try to analyze this is to optimize the level of the non-price instrument while holding fixed the number of people who are consuming. Why am I going to do that? Well, remember that the distortion that comes from monopoly that we studied on Friday is a reduction in the quantity. So I want to study how you design the you know, non-price characteristic of the product and how you distort that orthogonal to the effect that you have on quantity. I want to hold fixed the quantity 
when I think about how you're going to distort the non-price instrument. Okay. So, um, we are going to derive this using Leibniz's rule. Um, so, uh, Daniel Solis, um, can you tell me how I'm going to hold fixed the price, sorry, hold fixed the quantity while changing the non-price instrument by adjusting the price? How much will price have to change when I change the non-price instrument in order to hold fixed the, the quantity of people consuming? And don't look at your slides. You're a good mathematician. You can do this on your own. You can do it on the board if you want or on a paper or whatever. Yeah? Uh, with the price and with the quantity, and then we have uh, fixed the price. And so we want to we wanna hold fixed the quantity by allowing the price to adjust when we change the non-price instrument. How do we do that? Any, anyone else want to try? Yeah, go ahead, Roman. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this equation. We're going to say that we want the total effect of a change uh, on the quantity of change in rho, we can express that by the chain rule as the direct effect of a change in rho on the number of people plus the way the amount that the price changes when rho changes times the direct effect of a change in price on the number of people. Right? Now we calculated the effect of a change in price on the number of people. That was negative m, right? And we can use Leibniz's rule um, to take the derivative of um, the number of people directly with respect to the level of the non-price instrument. And how do we do that? Well, does the non-price instrument affect the interior of that integral? No, because it was just the density function. Does it affect the boundary? Yes because the boundary depended on the utility being greater than the price. How much does it affect the boundary? Well, it's the derivative of the function u minus p with respect to the level of coverage. Sorry, sorry, with respect to rho, the non-price instrument. What is that uh, derivative? Well, it's just the marginal utility of the non-price instrument to the people. Right? And so we get here the integral over the boundary set of u prime times f uh, d, d theta. Right? Okay. So let's define an expectation operator. So the expectation of x conditional on partial theta will be the average value of x conditional on partial theta, which is the ratio of the integral of x f of theta divided by the integral of f of theta, right? So then this whole expression becomes negative m times dp d uh, rho plus m times the expectation of u prime uh, conditional and partial theta. And so we can solve out this expression to find that dp d theta d rho is equal to the expected marginal utility of people who are marginal consumers, people in this boundary set. Does anyone have questions about this? Maria, go ahead. Um, yeah? It does. But if we're asking, if we're trying to hold fix the number of people, right, the number of people doesn't have any direct dependence 
on the level of row. It only is affected by who purchases and who doesn't purchase. OK. So this gives us the derivative of social welfare with respect to rho holding fixed the number of people because we can just decompose that into effects coming through directly changing the level of rho and the effect that rho has on the price. And Gabrielle, do you want to try to do that for us? No? Does anyone else want to try to do that? Yeah, go ahead, Ramon. You want to do it on the board? Yeah, please. Do you have the markers from Miguel or? So here's your so social welfare function. Yeah. 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 So um, if we apply this model to here, so the first effect is going to be on the counter. Yeah. It's going to be the prime of rho times the rho. Yeah. Um, and the effect of the answer. And in the interior, it's going to be here the theta and the set theta. It is going to be just the prime. Yeah? And that's the effect. Yeah? And the other effect is going to be just on the boundary because it is only depend in the boundary, yeah. right? And it's going to be plus a because the boundary depends negative on P. Yeah. It's going to be minus. And this is going to be Exactly. Times this here, right? And remember the expression that we found for that from before? So uh, the first thing is that rho theta here in the boundary is equal to the price? Exactly. And that's true for these guys too, right? So this is equal on the to the you see that on the boundary, everyone has the utility exactly equal to the price uh, time, times f of theta. And that's equal to the price too. So and remember and plug in the expression for that too. That'll help you. Uh, so this okay. This is in partial theta. And this is and because I can take the price exactly here. This is the same. Exactly. So those things cancel out. The, these effects are coming from people buying or not buying the good who are on the boundary. But all but we are holding fixed the total number of people, and so these two things cancel out with each other. Yeah. And so the yeah the final thing is just minus this or is plus this thing here. Yeah, minus the marginal cost, right. And so what's this thing here? Very well done, Roman. Um, the, uh, what's the, we get the expect, we get this expression here, which is the expectation of U prime conditional, not on partial theta, but on the whole set of participating individuals. The whole set of individuals who are buying the product times the number of people who are buying it. Right? So that's another expectation operator. That's the expectation along the interior rather than along the boundary. Right? So we get that the total effect on welfare is this number of people times their average marginal utility minus the, uh, the derivative of the cost with respect to the non-price instrument.
Okay. So then we're going to get a really simple formula for the optimum. So the optimum is given by setting the number of people times the average marginal utility of an average uh, purchaser of the product equal to the cost of providing it. Another way of saying is that, that the per person cost of providing the non-price instrument should be equated to the marginal utility of uh, the consumers from the instrument. Right? Okay. Now what about if we take the derivative of profits with respect to the non-price instrument? Uh, is Camilo here? No. Um, does, does anyone want to try to do that? Yeah, Juan, why don't you try doing that? And we're, remember, we're holding fixed the number of people as we do this, right? You can use the eraser up here, too. Or you can come on this side. So on the right side? The yeah. Right, yeah. But on the left side, can you go to this side? Yeah. Yeah. So what we get is n times the expected value yeah. of the marginal utility. Exactly. On the marginal set. The marginal set yeah. yeah, exactly. The boundary of the and so you don't need to take change n because n we're holding fixed as we do this, right? So you can uh, leave that constant. Very nice. So, uh, oops, this should be the expectation conditional on the marginal. Uh, and therefore, we're going to get a different expression, which is the number of people times the average marginal utility of the marginal consumers is now set equal to the marginal cost. So rather than setting the per person uh, cost of providing the non-price instrument equal to the average marginal utility of all consumers, we're going to set it equal to the average marginal utility of the marginal consumers. This, in essence, is the core principle of all extensive margin price discrimination. Everything else we're going to talk to about is, in some sense, going to come down to exactly this. This is the essence of price discrimination. You want to take money away from people who are going to buy the product anyway and give it to people who are just indifferent as to whether to buy the product or not. That's the key idea of price discrimination. And that's true for changes in prices. It's true for changes in non-price instruments. It's the basic principle of product design. And the reason is that you can't get any money from people who are already buying the product anyway. They're already buying the product. They're stuck there. There's, you, know, you don't gain anything from giving them extra utility. On the other hand, if you give extra utility to people who might buy the product, that's when you gain Money, right? Um, now, of course, if customers who are already buying the product can somehow influence the well-being of the firm by giving you bad reviews or by buying less things from you, that will offset that. And that's what we're going to talk about in the Musa Rosen model. But just to uh, emphasize this, the first thing to note is that Quality could be too high or too low. The non-price instrument could be too high or too low, depending on whether the marginal or the inframarginal consumers value it more. Second, I want to tell a little joke about this, this, this distortion is called the Spence distortion. The reduction in quantity we talked about on Friday is called the Corneau distortion. And I want to tell a little joke about the Spence distortion. So um, David Ben-Gurion, I don't know how many people know who David Ben-Gurion was, but he was the founder of the State of Israel. And in Israel, they had, a, they had a big problem, which is that, um, and I think people, other people who've gone to places where a lot of tourists visit will know that places tend to cater to the tourists and not to the people who already live there because uh, you know, they've got to attract the tourists where the people who already live there are stuck there. Right? And this was a really big problem in Israel because uh, they really wanted to get people to move to Israel uh, to, you know, to defend the country and so forth, to get Jews to move there. right? 
And so um, they always made it really attractive when you came to visit, and it wasn't so easy when you ended up living there. Um, I don't know if anyone here is Jewish, but there's a program called Birthright Israel that I went on this summer uh, where, where any Jewish person living around the world is paid by the government of Israel to come and visit Israel. And they show you a very good time when you come to visit them. Not necessarily what it's always like living in Israel, right? So uh, there's a famous joke about this. So David Ben-Gurion was the founder of the state of Israel, one of the founders of the state of Israel. And he um, supposedly died and went up to God. And God said to him, look, you've been so good to my people, the Jews, I'm going to let you choose whether you want to go to heaven or to hell. And he said, well, look, I've got to see both of them before I decide. And first he goes down to hell. And they're partying. There's all these beautiful women. You know, they're getting drunk. It's like the Berlusconi administration, right? And then he goes up to heaven. And they're talking about price discrimination and Marshallian dynamics and the future of the state of Israel. Now it's like the Obama administration up there, right? And so he says, look, I had such a good time. Uh, I, I had such a sober life, I did so much work for my people, I deserve some fun in the afterlife. So he decides to go to hell. And immediately they throw him onto the rack, they're pulling out his toenails, you know, they're waterboarding him. Now it's like the Bush administration, right? And, um, or maybe here I should say the Arabia administration or something like that, right? And so they, um, they, he says to Lucifer, I had such a good time five minutes ago, what happened in the interim? And he said, well, then you were a tourist, right? So that's the Spence distortion in action. Um, OK. Uh, uh, I think I just basically already said all this. Um, OK. Now, to capture the fact that sometimes when you hurt your inframarginal consumers, they might actually reduce their contribution to your value or otherwise hurt you. We're going to capture this by changing the cost function that you have. So rather than having your cost function just depend on rho in some unspecified black box way, we're now going to make the cost function directly depend on both the level of the non-price instrument, but also on the utility that you give to people, which depends on the non-price instrument. So if you reduce their utility, they may actually become more costly to you. Um, and therefore, uh, the cost, rather than just being C of rho, is now going to be the number of people times the expectation of the cost of each person, which depends on rho and depends on the utility that you do deliver to them which in indirectly depends on Rome. So that's going to make you potentially care about the uh, utility that you bring to people who are already buying your product. Um, so this is the focus of the Musa-Rosen model. Um, or models that are often called models of moral hazard. Whereas you change the utility you provide to people, you change their behavior and therefore how costly or profitable they are to you. Okay. Now, the benefit side of everything that we just said is going to stay exactly the same. The question now is how the cost uh, changes, right? Before, we just had C sub rho. What is that going to become now, uh, Oscar Serrano? Don't look at your slides. Look up. So this is our expression for cost now, right? And we just want to take a derivative of this expression with respect to rho. And we're holding the number of people fixed, right? So we've, the number of people is fixed, right? So we just need to take the expectation of the derivative of this interior part, right? What's the derivative of this interior part? C prime plus, it also depends on the utility that people get, right? Yeah? 
times dc du, right? That, so uh, when you change price, that's going to now, rather than just being the derivative of the number of, peop of cost with respect to the number of people, it's now going to be the number of people who are on the margin times the average cost of serving the people on the margin. So we have this new expression for marginal cost, the number of people on the margin times the uh, expectation of people on the margin. That's the derivative of cost with respect to price. And then uh, when we divide that by the number of people on the margin, we're going to call this uh, expectation of the cost conditional on being on the margin, the marginal cost. And because everyone on the margin has a utility that's exactly equal to price, right? We're, this is just going to be the cost of people who have a utility equal to price and a, uh, and a value of this characteristic row. Second, we're going to have what I was just going over with Oscar. We're going to have when we change the um, When we change the level of the non-price instrument, that's going to bring in the number of people on the margin um, times the expectation of the product of their marginal utility and the cost of them plus the number of people times the expectation of the derivative of cost with respect to price plus their marginal utility times the a derivative of cost with respect to utility, right? And so if we hold the number of people fixed, our cost function is just going to become the number of people times the direct increase in cost plus the intensive, not extensive, sorry, gosh, there's a lot of mistakes here, intensive margin extraction. So that's the marginal utility that people get from an increase in this non-price instrument times however much of that you're able to capture. However much of a reduction in cost you get by increasing people's utility. Right? So that's what we were saying. You know, if, if when you increase, when you decrease people's utility, they're going to say bad things about your product or otherwise increase the cost to you, that uh, will be taken into account in this term. And that's the essence of second degree price discrimination. Um, so, for example, if you give consumers higher utility, they may now be more loyal to your products. And that might create more profits for you in the long term. Um, or they might buy more products from you if you give them higher utility. And that might give, give you more profits or less cost, right? So, um, that will be the essence of second degree price discrimination. That you're going to trade off your incentive, your spence incentive, which is to try to get as much as you can out of the people who are stuck there, against the cost that if you decrease those people's utility, it might raise your cost. OK. Now finally, I want to introduce this sorting effect that I talked about. So suppose now that consumers are diverse in terms of the costs that they create for the firm. So now I'm going to simplify the double dependence of cost back down to just saying you have a cost which depends on the level of coverage, sorry, which depends on the non-price instrument, rho, as well as on your type. And that captures what we were doing here, but is much more general because it allows for any interaction between the level of uh, the non-price instrument row and your type in determining the cost. So in that case, the derivative of cost with respect to an increase in row has again two components from Leibniz's rule, right? We've got the effect on the interior, the number of people times the marginal cost, the average marginal cost of increasing the non-price instrument for those people, both coming through any change in their behavior and coming through uh, the direct costs, plus the number of people who are on the boundary, the density of people on the boundary, times the Leibniz boundary term, right? Which is how much people are attracted by a change in the non-price instrument 
multiplied by the value of the interior quantity. What's that interior quantity? Just the cost of providing those people with the, the product, right? And that's capturing the fact that now people are heterogeneous in terms of how costly it is to provide them with the product, right? Some people are cheap to provide with the product, some people might be expensive, right? Now, to hold fixed the number of people, right, we're going to allow the price to rise, just as we did before, right? So, we're going to have to subtract off the average cost of providing people on the boundary times the number of people on the boundary times the amount that the price rises, which is the average marginal utility of those marginal consumers, right? So, um, there should be a minus sign here. God, I'm sorry. Uh, the number of, so if we subtract this from this, we get the number of people on the boundary times the number, times the expectation of the product of marginal utility and cost minus the product of the expectations of marginal utility and cost conditional on the boundary. Now remember that the difference between the expectation of a product and the product of the expectations is the covariance. You guys remember that from your statistics class? So this whole term becomes the number of people on the boundary times the covariance between people's marginal utility and the cost of providing them with the product. And this is the sorting cost of increasing rho where the negative of it is the sorting benefit of increasing row. That is, to the extent that increasing row selectively attracts people who are more costly, you're going to want to reduce row. To the extent that, select, that increasing row selectively attracts the least costly people, you'll want to increase row. And this is a very intuitive quantity. What is it? It's the covariance between people's preferences and their costs between the marginal utility they get from a change in the non-price instrument and the value that those people bring along the marginal set. Now, because we still have this change in the cost as we change rho, we still have the musa rosen effect we were talking about before. So this now is the full Vega-Weil model that I was promising you. And again, Gabrielle, what are the three effects that we went through that this model captures? We just went through three effects, right? We went through the Spence effect, the Musa, what, what are those three effects? Yeah? Uh, uh, Anyone else want to say what the three effects are? Yeah, go ahead, Sebastian. Yeah, so the, the, the fact that you target the marginal consumers rather than the inframarginal consumers, the fact that you worry about how much changing the utility of the inframarginal consumers affects the value that you extract from them, and how much you sort for the most valuable consumer, right? Catering to marginal consumers, this is the fundamental discrimination motive. Extraction from the inframarginal consumers which is the intensive margin effect that disciplines your ability to discriminate. And finally, your sorting, uh, your sorting incentive to try to uh, attract the most valuable consumers. Um, now, this is not necessarily discriminatory. And as we'll see below, it can actually end up disciplining your incentives to discriminate. So the basic discriminatory incentive is the Spence effect. The first sort of discipline on that is the inframarginal effect, and then we'll see how the sorting effect interacts with both of those things. Okay, 
And before we go on, uh, why don't we take a 10-minute break here, and then we'll power through the last hour and a half. <laughs>